we're going to be looking at nomenclature um, from the perspective of ionic compounds. But any time that you're naming uh, a compound or molecule, you need to ask yourself whether or not you have an ionic or covalent compound. And remember, that has to do with what the compound is composed of. Um, for ionic compounds, you're looking for um, a metal and a nonmetal. That's the simplest way to look at it or a positively and negatively charged ion that's composing the molecule. Co for covalent compounds, you're looking for um, nonmetals um, or metalloids and nonmetals. Um, and basically, those are the simple ways to identify whether you have an ionic or covalent compound. Um, the next thing you're going to do is basically follow the rules that we're going to discuss for your specific type of compound, whether it's ionic or covalent. So for naming ionic compounds, um, it's a pretty straightforward approach, um, but has multiple layers. So the first basic thing you must understand is that the cation, um, which is usually the metal, is the thing that is written first. Okay, this is followed by the anion, um, which is typically your nonmetal, um, and your ending is going to change um, when you're dealing with uh, regular elements. We'll talk about polyatomic uh, nomenclature um, in a separate uh, separate series. So you have your cation, which is uh, your metal, typically. You have your anion, which is typically your nonmetal. And you change the ending of your nonmetal's name to IDE. Okay, so that's just the basic idea. The ba so when you're naming ionic compounds, um, the way that we uh, write them is the first thing is the cation, or the metal, is written first. Um, the anion is written second, um, and the anion's ending is changed um, to IDE um, if it's just an element. If it's a polyatomic, we'll talk about how we name those um, in a different uh, video. Now, the next thing you need to look at is your specific um, example. Now, each specific example um, is going to cons need to be um, considered individually. And what you need to focus on is the metal component of each example. If your metal is from groups 1A, 2A, or 3A, so basically these two or this one, you're going to use a very simple, straightforward approach. Okay, so what you do is you just write the metal, okay, or the cation first, you write the nonmetal, and you change the IDE ending. As I said, we'll talk about the polyatomics um, in a different video. Okay, so BAO, okay, BA is from uh, this group right here, okay, um, so barium is going to just be written as barium, that's how we would write it, okay, oxygen in this case, instead of writing oxygen, notice I've written ox, I-D-E, so oxide, so BAO becomes barium oxide, okay, NaCl, the same setup is seen, okay, um, we have our uh, metal from this group right here, okay? So we know that we're gonna follow this set um, of nomenclature protocol. So the cation, the sodium metal gets written first, so sodium, right? And chlorine right here um, becomes chlor IDE, chloride, okay? So you now get sodium chloride. So that's the basic approach to um, ionic compounds that have metals from groups um, 1A, 2A, or 3A. Now, when we start to consider other metals other than um, ones from 1A, 2A, and 3A, we must uh, take a very um, somewhat different approach. So, in this situation, is your metal a transition metal? So, is it one of the metals in here? Um, and if the answer to that is yes, then you must use Roman numerals, or the stock system as it's known, to show the charge on the cation that you are um, or that is present in the molecule. And the reason why we have to do this is because transition metals, a lot of them have multiple oxidation states available. And because of that, um, you typically need to indicate, is it, you know, plus one, plus two, plus three, etc. So if we look at the example here that we've been given, um, CuCl2, okay, we've already been given the answer, but let's actually break this down. So first of all, CuCl2, if we look at this, um, we very quickly realize that we first of all have a transition metal, right? Copper is uh, <clears throat> right here on the periodic table, 
Okay, so we know we have an ionic compound, we know we have a transition metal, so we know that we're going to have to be using the Roman numerals. Okay, so um, the nomenclature approach is exactly the same except for the Roman numeral. Okay, so if we're going to go ahead and name this, we could do this um, in a generic way. Okay, so you could write copper, okay, because that's your cation. We don't know its charge yet, so we're going to go ahead and put our parentheses. And chlorine, okay, is our... Uh, non-metal that's going to be acting as our anion. Remember we changed the ending to IDE. Okay, so copper something chloride is what we're going to end up with um, as our name. Now we need to figure out and identify what the uh, charge is here on this copper. And the way we do that is we look at the anion, its charge, and the number of those um, ions present. So um, if we look at copper um, in this situation, okay, we need to know what the charge is up here. Okay, well, this charge is going to be dictated by the charge coming from the anions. Okay, so we know based on our understanding of the periodic table that chlorine normally forms a minus one charge, so it can be like its nearest noble gas, argon. It picks up an electron. Okay, so we know that we have two chloride ions. We have two negatively charged ions here, right? So if I have two negatively charged things, this charge has to be balanced by the copper. So in copper situation, if I have two negatively charged things that I'm having to balance, I'm going to need a positive two here, okay? So in order to balance these two numbers, okay, the summation here Okay, and the overall charge here on this metal has to balance out. Okay, so I know that my copper has a plus 2 charge, so I put the Roman numeral 2 here in the parentheses. Okay, and this is true um, for whatever sample or whatever example that you utilize. It doesn't just work with copper. It works with all the transition metals. What you do is you make sure that you are considering... First of all, of course, that you have a transition metal. You've identified that. You wrote the generic formula um, with a blank here because you don't know the charge for your parentheses. Okay, so remember, because you have a transition metal, you need the parentheses, um, but everything else is going to be exactly the same. And then you need to consider what the charge on the metal is. Okay, and the way you uh, calculate that or the way you figure that out um, is you look at the charge on each of the anions that are present and the total number of each of those anions and you get that total overall charge. That total overall charge has to be balanced by the charge that's present on the metal. So in this case we have a minus two charge coming from the two chloride ions or a total of a minus two charge coming from those two chloride ions. So I'm going to need a positive to charge to be on the copper ion that's present. So then I put that in Roman numeral form into my parentheses and I subsequently properly named my ionic compound. So we do need to talk about a couple of exceptions. Obviously there's more than you know, just four exceptions. Uh, but these are the ones that come up very um, frequently. So I want you guys to make sure that you're uh, familiar with them and properly naming your substances. Okay, so um, we know, or we just talked about uh, nomenclature uh, and using nom Roman numerals, um, basically that stock system. Now, we know that whenever we have transition metals, um, we are typically going to be using those parentheses. Um, however, there are two main group elements, both tin and lead, okay? They actually have the possibility of multiple oxidation states as well, okay? So plus two and plus four are very common oxidation states for both of them, okay? So anytime you're naming um, a substance um, that contains tin or lead, you are going to be using the parentheses, okay? So you wouldn't be doing that with the other um, main group elements. You wouldn't see yourself doing that with any of... Um, any of these um, these main group elements. However, you will be doing it uh, with tin and lead. Okay. Um, another exception to the rule um, are actually transition metals themselves. Okay. So notice zinc and silver; their oxidation states are plus two and plus one. 
Um, and, and because they are always plus 2 and plus 1, um, you don't include the parentheses, okay? So no parentheses for these two examples. Okay, it's a redundancy. Um, silver plus 1 and zinc plus 2, those are the oxidation states that we see all the time. Um, so we subsequently don't utilize the parentheses. So these are just a few exceptions for you to consider um, and make sure that you include into your naming repertoire. So let's do a few practice problems, um, basically utilizing what we learned. Okay, the first things first is uh, we want to look at all of our examples really quickly here. Okay, we have a metal, non-metal, metal, non-metal, metal, non-metal, metal, non-metal, metal, non-metal. Non non okay, um, you know that these are all ionic compounds, so we can just utilize the ionic um, uh, compound nomenclature approach. So, no stress there. Okay, the next thing, obviously, that we look for on each of these problems, and we'll look at them individually now, is whether or not the metal or the cation is a... Um, Transition metal. Okay, so remember your transition metals are the one in the middle, ones in the middle. So copper right here, copper is right here on the periodic table, so it is a transition metal. So we know that we're going to be needing the parentheses. It's not one of the exceptions that we just discussed on the last slide, so um, copper is going to be named uh, in the appropriate manner utilizing the stock system. Okay, so we know that typically we'd write this as copper, okay, because the metal or the cation gets written first. We know we need parentheses because it's a transition metal. And chloride, right? It's copper something chloride, right? These are the normal uh, steps that we would take. Now, in order to figure out the charge on the copper, remember the number that's, the Roman numeral that's inside the parentheses is your um, charge on your metal. Okay, so what we need to look at here are the charges and the number of ions that are present on the anions uh, portion of the molecule. Okay, so chlorine, okay, we know it forms a minus charge to give us chloride when it becomes um, an ion. So I have two negatively charged ions, right, so that needs to be balanced by a positive charge. I only have one copper. So plus 2 is what I have on that copper um, ion. So I have copper 2 chloride um, as my name. Okay, let's go ahead and let's move on to the next example. Okay, we have NaF. Okay, sodium is in this first um, group. So we know that we do not need parentheses. It's not a transition metal. It's not an exemption. Um, so Na, we know that that is sodium. Oop, excuse me. Okay, sodium. No parentheses. We know that fluorine, okay, is going to be our anion. So we're going to add that IDE ending to give us fluoride. Sorry about that. Okay, so that's just the basic nomenclature for these first two examples. Um, we take the same approach with the others that we're going to be looking at. Okay, so Magnesium, that's in those first two groups, so we're just going to give, that's just going to give us magnesium, um, magnesium chloride. Okay, once again, um, we have a group one element with potassium, right? So potassium iodide, okay? And when we look at this last example here, once again, we notice uh, titanium. We notice that we are back into the transition um, elements. It's not one of the exceptions. Okay, so we write this in the generic right way. We write titanium. Okay, we need to figure out uh, what the charge is on that metal, so we're definitely going to have parentheses. Oxygen becomes oxide. Okay, pretty straightforward. Okay, now let's go ahead and let's figure out the charge on that titanium. Okay, I have oxygen atoms. Oxygen forms a minus 2 ion when it forms its oxide ion. I have two of those, right? So I have two, two minus charged ions present. Okay, so that's going to give me a total of minus 4. I have a single titanium, so my titanium needs to have a plus 4 on it. So the parentheses remember, indicates the charge on the metal. So we're going to have the Roman numeral 4 in those parentheses. So we just write it in like this, okay, and titanium 4 oxide is subsequently what you have. So remember, the basic approach, 
All you have to do is make sure that you're checking if you have an ionic compound. That's the first thing. Then you have to figure out where your um, metal is located on the table. Is it a transition metal or is it one of the main group, um, first main group metals? Okay, depending on that, if it's, it's a main group metal, you just uh, write out the name, cation first, anion second with an IDE ending. Okay, if it is a transition metal, um, then you need to write uh, the same approach, the uh, cation first, the anion with an IDE ending, but you have to indicate the charge on the metal, okay, by using a Roman numeral. And you, you figure out the charge based on the charge of your counter ion or that anion, okay? You look at the charge of the anion and how many of those anions you have present in that molecule, um, and you can subsequently figure out your charge on your metal. So this is basic ionic nomenclature.